Shalom, beloved. Welcome to the Mighty Hand of God Ministries. I'm Scott Moore. We are discussing the living God. The living God that is not revealed in Egypt. Amen. Let's turn to 1 Samuel, which is Shemuel Aleph, chapter 17. And I'm going to start at verse 1. The Philistines rallied their troops for war. That's the, the Philistines. Assembling at Soko in Yehuda and setting up camp between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Dami. Shaul, that's Saul, and the men of Israel assembled, set up camp in the Elah Valley, and drew up their battle line opposite to Philistim. The Philistim occupied a position on one hill and Israel a position on another hill, with the valley between them. There came out a champion from the camp of the Philistim named Goliath, or Goliath as we call him, from Gat, who was nine feet nine inches tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore bronze armor plate weighing 120 pounds. He had bronze armor protecting his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as big as a weaver's beam, and an iron spearhead weighed 15 pounds. His shield bear, bearer went ahead of him. He stood and yelled at the army of Israel, Why come out and draw up a battle line? I am a Philistine, and you are servants of Shaul. So choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he can fight me and kill me, we'll be your slaves. But if I beat him and kill him, you will become slaves and serve us. The Philistine added, I challenge Israel's armies today. Give me a man and we'll fight it out. And when Shaul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were shaken and terrified. Verse 12. Now David was the son of of a, that Ephrati from Beit Lechem in Yehuda named Yeshai, Jesse is what we call him. He had eight sons, and in time of Shaul, he was old. The years had taken their toll. Yeshai's three oldest sons had followed Shaul to battle. Their names were three. The names of the three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn. Next to him was Avinidab, and the third Shammah. Now, David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Shaul. David went back and forth from Shaul to pasture his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Or Bethlehem. Meanwhile, the Philistine approached with his challenge every morning and evening for 40 days. So when you see the number 40, uh, 40 days, uh, Yeshua fasted. 40 days, Moshe on the mountain. 40 years in the wilderness. 40 is a number of testing trials in this, the earthly realm. So it's the number of testing trials of the covenant. This four represents the earth, four seasons of the earth, four corners of the earth, and the ten of the covenant. And so it's 40 means that testing is the, the number of testing and trials in the earth. That's what this 40 is. And so, and it's a complete testing and trials. And so, it says that every morning and evening for 40 days, he did this. It's just like Yeshua fasting 40 days and then being tempted by the, by the devil. It's the same as the 40 years in the wilderness. The same 40 as Moshe on the mountain. It's that number of 40. Now, verse 17, Yeshai said to David, his son, Please take your brothers five bushels of this roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread. Hurry and carry them to your brothers at the camp. Five represent the number of liberty. It represents the number of grace and mercy. And ten represents the number of covenant, like I said before. 
this covenant as well as testing. So it's approving of the covenant. Also, bring these ten cheeses and their to their field officer. Find out if your brothers are well, and bring back some token from them. And Shaul and your brothers with all the army of Israel are in the Elah Valley fighting the Philistim. So David got up early in the morning, left the sheep with a helper, took his load and set out as Yeshai, as Yeshai uh, had ordered him. He arrived at the barricade of the camp just as the troops were going out to their battle stations and shouting the war cry. <laughs> now they've been doing this for 40 days. Um, they've just been shouting their battle for They're all shaking. They're shaking in their boots. They're shaking by this this nine foot nine inch man, almost 10 feet tall. And um, so they're shaking by this, but yet they're still going out here and doing their war cry. So Israel and the Philistim had set up their battle lines facing each other. Now but David left his equipment in charge of the equipment guard, ran to the troops, went to his brothers and asked if they were well. And as he was talking with them, there came the champion. Now this must be either the 40th or the 41st day. Uh, the Philistine from Gad named Goliath, or Goliath, Goliath, Goliath from the ranks of the Philistim, saying the same words as before. And David heard them. And when the soldiers from Israel saw the man, they all ran away from him, terrified. The soldiers from Israel said to each other, You saw that man who just came up. Uh, he has come to challenge Israel. To whoever kills him, the king will give rich reward. He'll also give him his daughter and exempt his father's family from all service and taxes in Israel. Man, that would be awesome to have all your taxes exempt, not just for you, but for your whole family. Wow, that's like, that's almost like a 24% a increase for, for most of us. Amen. The Lord is ministering to somebody's heart. Uh, it's on the right side of the chest. Uh, be healed and receive your healing in the presence of Yeshua. Also, there's some head pains that are being ministered to. Be healed in the presence of Yeshua. Amen. Verse 26. So Davi said to the man standing with him, What reward will be given to the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? It's a disgrace for Israel because Israel means the prince with God, those who rule like God and rule with God. Um, Israel. And, and this is the disgrace because they are not representing those who are ruling like the living God. They are not representing princes of God. They are not representing those who have prevailed with God and with men. Those are the things, some of the things that were spoken when Jacob, Yaakov, got this name, Israel. And we'll read that in a little bit. It's over in the book of Genesis. We'll read that um, next. Now, David goes on to say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway that he challenges the armies of the living God? Not just the armies of God, but the armies of the living God. Meaning that there's one living God and his armies are supported, backed, financed, provided for with all they need according to the riches of glory, the living God. The living God is the, the source and the strength behind the armies of the living God. And so if the living God, his armies, are arrayed for battle, then what is the holdup? What is keeping them from, from this man from, from go ahead and granting the request of this uncircumcised uncovenanted uh, a person who is not a people with the living God who's who is not joined he is not aligned he is not um, in, in religion or or um, uh, or legion with the living God meaning there's a living God and then there's whoever is not for him is against him um, if you are the living God and you are with his team, 
then you are for, you are legion, you are re legion or religion with the living God. And everything contrary to that is not just your adversary, but it's God's adversary. And so there is a disgrace for Israel to have this uncircumcised, this uncovenanted, mere mortal challenging them every day and having them acting terrified. In verse 24, it says, When the soldiers from Israel saw the man, they all ran away from him, terrified. Now, the scripture says, If God be for you, who can be against you? Uh, apparently, they forgot that. And so David is saying that there's a disgrace here. And, and we are the armies of the living God. So who is he? Who is he to come up against the armies of the living God? Amen. The living God, a God of war, a man of war, the living God. That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about a dead God. We're not talking about some absentee father God. We're not. No, this is the living God. Amen. God is alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 27. The people answered with what they had been saying, adding, that's what will be done for the man who kills him. Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when David spoke to the men, and, and it made Eliab angry at him. And he asked, why did you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You just came down to watch the fighting. Now David said, what have I done now? I only asked a question. He turned away from him with someone else and asked the same question, and the people gave him the same answer. <laughs> now, now, apparently, something David said pricked Eliab's heart. Apparently, Eliab knows he should be uh, manning up because he is supposed to be in allegiance with the living God, and he's supposed to be representing the army of the living God. So something in him was um, where he had to feel like he had to justify himself, and now he's blaming David for his conceit, as if conceit is going to be enough to um, to go up against this this Goliath, this this Goliath. It's going to take more than some conceitedness to to face your your um your giants we all have gold yachts in our lives uh for some people it's it's uh substance abuse for some people it's relational abuse for some people it's greed it's pride it's arrogance um this gold yacht comes in all shapes and sizes and in order for us to get on board with the living god Amen. Because the scripture talks about um, the, the, the mind of man and the heart of man being at enmity with God, being hostile against God. Our near flesh and carnality is hostile against God. So if we're going to come in line with the living God, we're going to have to face these giants, these Goliaths in our life and slay them. Somebody is being ministered to. There's a pain on the right side of your... Um, of your glutamus, <laughs> the glutamus maximus, your butt. There's a, a pain on the right cheek. Um, be healed in the presence of Yeshua. It's, a, it's either a bruise in the bone or the, a bruise in the muscle or there's a knot in the muscle. Receive your healing in the presence of Yeshua. Now, let me um, just iterate something. Um, when I hit words of knowledge for healing, I feel in my body and I try to describe with accuracy, not just where I feel it at, but what I'm feeling. Um, I, it may to me feel like a bruise to you. It just may feel like an aggravation or a numbing. Or it may be something um, deeper than that. I'm just going by what I feel in my body and trying to explain the accuracy of it. Sometimes the Lord tells me exactly what it is. For example, I, there was a time where a woman I saw in a wheelchair, some of you heard me speak it before, and um, I could see her walking and then she'll sit in her wheelchair. And so I just asked the Lord, I was like, I wonder what's wrong with her, Lord. And then he said, sciatic nerve. So I heard sciatic nerve. 
and I didn't feel sciatic nerve. I heard sciatic nerve. Now there's other times where I was um, sitting over my father's house and he had some pain in him and his sciatic nerve was uh, would flare up or was, um, it, to me it almost felt like electrical uh, shock was going through that area. And so um, I felt that. But with the woman, I didn't feel it. I just, I heard it. I heard it in my spirit. I didn't hear it in my outer ear, but it was as if I heard it in my mind. It's like uh, I was thinking and the conversation was coming to my thoughts, but I didn't hear it from out here. I heard it from inside. And so when I spoke that to her, she said, yes, that's what it is. Because I asked her, I said, I don't have anything to lose. I just, by any chance, is that your sciatic nerve that's causing you this problem? I didn't even know where the sciatic nerve was in the body at that time. And, um, and then she also did, said there was something in regards to her, her knee. And so, um, long story short, the next day, she was able to walk without her wheelchair. Um, and I, I just said a simple prayer with her. But, um, but I knew that when I had that word of knowledge that the Lord is not just putting me out there with words of knowledge and just talking about people, which is what uh, psychics do. They can tell you some things about yourself, but there's no ability with that to heal or bring any correction to it. And so there's a difference between a psychic versus a prophet. Um, one person says psychics talk to the dead and one said the prophets talk to the living. Or that same person says psychics talk to the dead and prophets talk to the living. But one thing about a prophet and the difference between a prophet and, and a psychic is that a psychic can only tell you something that is going on with you or something that's wrong with you. And it's just common, common knowledge type of things. And, a lot of times they're just like, oh, I got a 50-50 chance that this is true or not true. And then they'll just kind of put it out there for you to fill in the blanks. With a prophet, they can tell you something that God is adjusting. God is correcting what God is doing. Amen. Psychic can't tell you what God is doing. He just tell you what is going on, what has happened. And he may be able to, or she may be able to tell you just based on what is um, something that's lined up for in the future. Whereas a prophet can actually speak correction and actually turn that thing around for you. Amen. Psychic doesn't have that ability or power working with them to change things for you. It's just a matter of a sequence of events. This is going to lead to that. It's going to lead to this. It's going to lead to this. A prophet this may be leading to this but boom right here right now you're changed. When Samuel was poured, when oil was poured on, I Sammy, I'm sorry, when Samuel poured oil on Saul, Shaul, the king Saul, he poured a vial of oil on him. And the scripture says that when he turned around, he was a changed man. Let's find that. We're going to find that in the book of Samuel. Okay. Let's look at chapter nine, oh, chapter 10. Okay, so verse 1, it says, Then Shemuel took a flask of oil he had prepared and poured it on Shaul's head. He kissed him and said, Adonai, Yahweh, has anointed you to be prince over his inheritance. After you leave me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb, Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Seltzah. They will tell you that the donkeys you were searching for have been found and that your father has stopped thinking about the donkeys and is anxious over you and asking, what am I to do about my son? Go on from there and you will come to the Oak of Tabor. Three men will meet you there on the way up to, up to God at Bethel. One of them will be carrying three kids another three loaves of bread, and a third a skin of wine. So it sounds like communion is about to happen here. Uh, they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you are to accept from them. After that, you will come to Giva of God, where the Philistim are garrisoned. On arrival at the city there, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place, preceded by lutes, tambourines, flutes, lyres, 
they will be prophesying. Then the spirit of Yahweh will fall on you. You will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. When these signs come over you, just do whatever you feel like doing because God is with you. Wow, isn't that amazing? When the spirit of God falls on you, he said, just do what you feel like doing because the spirit of God is with you. That is amazing. That is how some like Saul, the, the apostle, can say, um, in him I live and move and have my being. Amen. Just do what you feel like doing. When the spirit of God is filling your heart, has come upon you. Amen. Just do what you feel like doing. And it will bring glory to God. Because God is with you. Mm, that's powerful. Verse 6, it says, Then the Spirit of Yahweh will fall on you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned to another man. 7, when these signs come upon you, just do whatever you feel like doing, because God is with you. Verse 8, Then you are to go down ahead of me to Gilgal, and there I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and present sacrifices of peace offerings. Wait there seven days until I come to you. And, and tell you what to do. As it happened, as soon as he had turned his back to leave Shemuel, Samuel, as soon as he turned his back to leave him, now he poured the oil on his head, a flask of oil, prophesied over his life. Now remember, I did a series about the apostle, and when you look at the the prophets of the Old Testament, you will see the workings and the, the connection, the ambassadorship of the modern-day apostle. Because um, I spoke about the difference between being an ambassador and being a citizen of the kingdom. Uh, both have great benefits. Both have what appears to be the same benefits. However, the ambassador, when the ambassador goes forth, the ambassador goes in an authority that a normal citizen would not have. Amen. Okay, verse, um, verse 9. I'm going to read it again. It says, that it, As it happened, as soon as he had turned his back to leave Shemuel, God gave him another heart, and all of those signs took place that day. And when they arrived at the hill, and there in front of him was a group of prophets, the Spirit of God fell on him, and he prophesied along with them. So, this is what a prophet, the authority of a prophet, the authority of an apostle. Remember, there were not any apostles in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is because the apostle means the sent one. In the Old Testament, it was unlawful for them to go outside of Israel. This is only for Israel. Amen. These prophets were sent to Israel. They weren't sent outside of that. When Yeshua came, he says, I only come for the lost sheep of Israel. I didn't come for the Gentiles. Amen. And so it was after he ascended and, um, that he that he left these gifts among men, one being the apostle, the sent one, who is to go out into all the world and preach this good news. It's not for citizens necessarily that it's not they're not commissioned to go out they're just being citizens of the kingdom of god wherever they are and people get drawn to that light amen that's a difference from um an apostle who is sent out into the uttermost parts of the earth um to um convert people convert people to the covenant of god and the kingdom of heaven so amen so that's why i just showed you that to say that Okay, now let's go back over to 1 Samuel 17. Okay, so verse 31. So David's words were overheard and told to Shaul, who summoned him. And David said to Shaul, No one should lose heart because of him. Your servant will go and fight the Philistine. And Shaul said to David, You can't go fight this Philistine. You are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. And David answered Shaul, Your servant used to guard his father's sheep. Now when a lion or a bear would come and grab a lamb from the flock, I would go after it and hit it and snatch the lamb from his mouth. And if it turned on me, I would catch it by the jaw, smack it, and kill it. <laughs> now this is, this is the David who has been anointed. Now we saw what happened to, 
to um, Shaul with a with a flask of oil. This is David who's been anointed with a horn of oil. We're talking about a flask versus a big shofar horn. That shofar horn full of the oil, the anointing of God, which represents the Holy Ghost. Now, this is what he does. He slaps. <laughs> what do you say? He, he smacks them and then catch it by the jaw, smack it, and kill it. Amen. And this is a lion or a bear. This is how he deals. And so, so 36. So your servant has defeated both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has challenged the armies of the what? The living God. Amen. We are part or protected by. We're either part of this army or we're protected by this army. Right? There's a benefit either way, whether God has called us to the battlefield or whether God has called us to watch over the, the treasure and, and protect that which he's already given to us. We see both scenarios as we look at the lives and how God led the children of Israel. We can see both of these happening here. But we're protected by the living God. And we are the armies of the living God. We are either a part of those armies or being protected by those armies. And the living God is the emphasis. Amen. We're not just a part of some dead God religion. We're part of the armies of the living God. That means there's life. There's a manifestation. There's a tangibility of life. There's evidence that God is alive with us, in us, through us. For us. Amen. Verse 37. Then David said, Yahweh who rescued me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will rescue me from the paw of this Philistine. And Shaul said to David, Go. <laughs> May Yahweh be with you. Amen. He's convinced now. Amen. You do it to a lion or a bear, then you get a pretty good chance of handling this nine foot nine guy. Because he's about as strong as a lion or a bear, in our opinions. Now, Shaul dressed David in his own armor. He put the bronze helmet on his head and gave the armor plate to wear. Now, bronze, we see bronze and we also see, um, well, we'll just say the bronze. It usually represents uh, some type of judgment. Amen. When we see gold and silver, those represent God's uh, salvation and God's love, right? The gold represents God's love and his person, his personality, the love of God, the person of God, the glory of God. And then when we see silver, it talks about redemption, his salvation, his purchasing with, with silver. That's the redemption of God. But when we see bronze, that usually speaks of the judgment. Because we see the, the brazen altar, bronze and brazen, the brazen altar, that was for the sacrifice to be burned. That was the judgment. Amen. That's not like the mercy seat, which is where God is seated at. Amen. That's where we, um, we boldly approach the throne of, of um, grace so we can see mercy in time of need. Well, it was the mercy seat with the cherubim, and God sat between the two cherubim upon the mercy seat, which was above the Ark of the Covenant, which had in it the Ten Commandments. And so this covenant that we have with God is full of grace, and God sits over it. When we look in Revelation, we see the living waters flowing from up under it. And so this is the grace by which we were saved uh, through faith. Amen. It's the grace that is connected to coming in covenant with God. If you have not cut the covenant of God, if you have not said, yes, I will keep, observe, and do your Ten Commandments, then do so. Do so, and you will experience the grace of God through the blood of the covenant. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, through his blood, this gracious, merciful covenant comes to life. Amen. The veil is removed. We see and we are transformed into the image of God's glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, verse 30, verse 38. Shaul dressed David in his own armor. 
He put the bronze helmet on his head and gave the armor plate to wear. 39. David buckled his sword on his, on his armor and tried to walk, but he wasn't used to such equipment. So David said to Shaul, I can't move wearing these things because I'm not used to them. So David took them off. Then he took his stick in his hand and picked five smooth stones from the, from the riverbed, putting them in his shepherd's bag in his pouch. He put stones in his shepherd's bag. He's got a stick and a shepherd's bag, and he puts five smooth stones from the riverbed into that shepherd's bag, into that pouch. Amen. So these are the things that he used to kill the lion and the bear with. These are the things that God has entrusted in his hand to beat um, Goliath with. These are the things that he has trust. He is skilled in these things. And so this is what he's going to use rather than using what man is giving him to use. He's going to use what the Lord has trained him up in. Amen. It's not the same. Um, this is what has been effective in armies. It's not like this, this sword and this armor and this shield and this helmet have not been effective in battle. It's just that David is skilled in some other tools. And so you may find yourself in situations where um, you are required or you are expected to use a certain skill set or do things a certain way. Yet God has given you a way that has set you apart, that has made things easier for you. And so you have to figure out a way to incorporate those things and then you will see yourself blossom you'll see yourself grow you will see yourself climbing not the ladder but the rope of god's success amen i said it's a rope not a ladder it's a rope now we do see the jacob's uh what we call jacob's ladder the ladder um that from heaven that touches the earth but that was not for men that was for angels amen god has has shown me in a vision a rope amen and what he showed me is that um, it was actually related to a, sp a specific person. And I told that person, because, and, he was, and he bore witness to it because in his job it was the same type of scenario. And so I just explained the dream to him. And so what I saw was that he was on a certain level. And then there was people down below that needed help. And that he... What, there was no one to help them. And so what he did is he went from his level up here down to help those. And when he got down there, there was a rope that reached all the way up to the ceiling that reached above the level that he was at. And so he started climbing that rope. But it's because he went down to help that he was able to climb that rope all the way up to the top. And that's where he saw success. And so he was really excited about that. I didn't get to talk to him afterwards to see what the results were. And I love to find out um, if he somehow um, you know, watches this broadcast and he's able to email me on the screen and just let me know what happened. And some of you let me know. I feel the presence of God right now. The Lord is speaking to someone in regards to humbling themselves. Amen. You're at this level. You want to go here, but you're at this level. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due season. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Humble yourself. Go down to that level where God is telling you to go, but you feel it's beneath you. You don't want to go. Um, you think that people are trifling, so you don't want to go there. But when you do, God will reveal the rope to you, and it's in the thing that you want to be is in management, but the better part of management is that you have to be able to train those and you have to be able to relate to those and you have to be the servant. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you have to be the servant of them all. And God is going to reveal the rope to you through your service, right? Being a servant of them all and you will be able to climb that rope to the top. Amen. Okay, so let's go to verse, let's go to verse 30, 31. Oh no, sorry. We're going to verse, verse 
verse 40. Okay, so then he took the stick in his hand, picked five smooth stones uh, from the riverbed, putting them in a shepherd's bag in his pouch. Then, with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine, with his shield bearer ahead of him, came nearer and nearer to David. The Philistine looked... <laughs> He looked David up and down. Now, this is something that's it's funny to me because this is one of those things that, you know, in my culture, you get, that's a disrespectful thing. You look somebody up and down, you're disrespecting them. Like, who do you think you are? You know, and it's usually with a not happy face, or not a happy look on your face. It's usually some sort of snarl on your face and you're looking somebody up and down. And so that's like, you know, who do you think you are without saying who you think you are? So it says this Philistine looked David, verse 42, he looked David up and down and had and had nothing but scorn for what he saw. The boy with ruddy cheeks, red hair, and good looks. Now, 43, the Philistine said to David, am I a dog? Is that why you're coming at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. Now remember, David is coming at him in the name of the living God. He's representing the army of the living God. Now Philistine, he, Goliath, Goliath, he's cursing David by his God. So, so when you see this war here, when you see any kind of war, this war is basically your God against my God. That's what every war, and they try to put it into sports, you know, you, you try to get, um, you know, you see both sides praying, right? And they are hoping that the God of this team is going to help them win over the God of the other team. And, um, and so in wars, you're seeing it's their God against your God, the God of the United States of America versus the God of you know, whatever, whatever country that is coming up against them. And when they're victorious, it feels like their God has blessed them to win. They feel like their God is God until someone else with a greater God comes and defeats them. And then they'll say something like, truly your God is God. At least that's the way it goes in the Bible. When a, when a prophet comes, um, or when there's a great display of God, then it's like, truly your God is God. You know, in the situations with Daniel in the lion's den, it was truly Daniel's God is God. Amen. Amen. Uh, verse 44. Then the Philistine said to David, come here to me so I can give your flesh to the birds in the air and the wild animals. Verse 45, and David answered the Philistine, you are coming at me with a sword and sphere and a javelin, but I am coming at you in the name of Yahweh Svaot, the master avenger, the God of hosts, the God of armies. Amen. This is who I'm coming at you in the name of. Now you coming at me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. And obviously he's got a curse of his God that he's coming with. But I am coming at you in the name of Yahweh Sfaot, the God of the armies of Israel. Not just one army. Twelve legions. Twelve leagues of armies whom you have challenged now he thought he was challenging perhaps the the armies of Israel maybe the armies of Israel thought that Goliath Goliath was challenging the armies of Israel David David he he heard a challenge of the armies of the living God. Meaning that the living God now is being attacked. You're attacking my God. Now it's okay, perhaps, for you to attack me, for you to attack my team, but don't mess with my God. Amen? The living God. Now I got to stand up and come at you in the name of the living God, and we're gonna see whose God is God. We see a situation by the prophet Eliyah, and 
the prophets of Baal to see whose God is God. He said, if Baal be God, then go and, and, and worship Baal. But why are you standing between the two? Don't stand between the two. Choose a God. Amen. Joshua, Yoshua, when he came into the promised land, he stole the children of Israel. I'm presenting you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life. He says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the living God. Amen. You choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the living God. The living God. Never just God. You hear a lot of talk about God. God this and God that. And, and you know, um, but what about the living God? Now that right there, you start talking to somebody about a living God. I'm like, what do you mean, the living God? What do you mean this God is alive? Now we're going to have to show some evidence. Now there's some sort of showdown that has to take place. Now there's got to be something that helps me to understand that, there's, that this God is alive. Now, if you're just talking about God, then for the most part, for most people, you're just talking about something that's going to happen when they die. You know, if, if I'm a young person, if I'm 20, 30, 40, even 50, right? I'm going to be 50 in a, in a few months. Um, then I'm thinking, you know, I still got about 40, 50, 60, 70 years before I see this God. So what's the big deal? You know, because this God that you're talking about is only there to assure me, you know, it's fire insurance. It's assure me that I escape the lake of fire, that I escape hell, that I go to heaven when I die. But when you're talking about the living God, when you're talking about the God of the living and not the God of the dead, now, now you've intrigued me because now this God has something to do and has some relevance in this life. This life right here, right now, right? I'm not talking about a dead God. And, and this living God that I'm talking about, he's not even revealed until you come out of Egypt. You're not going to be able to see him and understand him and relate to him in Egypt. You're going to have to come out of where you are to meet this living God. Now, I've heard people say they got to meet you wherever you are right here, right now. That's only a partial truth. Amen. The whole of that truth is you have to humble yourself and you have to draw near to God. You have to submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. So that's the wholeness of that truth there. We have to receive this Yeshua, the Messiah. We have to receive this blood that he spilled for us. We have to receive that his body was broken for us. We have to receive this covenant that he spoke and that who he was the, the physical um, manifestation of this word that was with God in the beginning and that was God. The word, the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his finger upon a stone that the living God wrote with his finger. You have to be a living God if you can write with your finger. Um, a dead God can't write with a finger. A dead God might not even have a finger to write with. Amen. But the living God, this is who we're dealing with. This is what we're talking about. This is what I'm sharing with you and expressing to you. I'm not sharing with you some dead religion about a dead God who is there to greet the dead once they die. And he's ready to receive you into eternity when you die. I'm talking about a living God that's alive right now who is ready to receive you right now and help you right now where you are. However, there has to be a repentance. The, the commanded message of the apostle of the covenant. Right? When I say the apostle, I'm saying I'm one of the apostles. Amen. That's what the Lord called me, an apostle. And the commanded message is repent, turn for the kingdom of heaven. Because it's near you. It's at hand. It's not about the kingdom of heaven for when you die one day. No, it's right here, right now. Repent, turn your heart, turn your focus, right? Draw near. Because the kingdom of God 
which means that the living God is at hand. And that's why the miracles, that's why the healings is such a beautiful, um, it's, a, it's a flow. It's an air, it feels airy, but it also feels like a river of air. If you can imagine that, a river of air of the Holy Ghost and His peace, His shalom, is flowing. Mm. Amen. Okay, let's get back to it. Verse 46 says, Today, Yahweh will hand you over to me. I will attack you. <laughs> this is funny. You know, I, I watch a lot of kung fu movies. I watch a lot of movies in general. But, you know, sometimes you see a kung fu movie or you see some sort of fight. And they tell the guy, all right, I'm going to kick you on the right side of your face with my left foot. You know, so this is what David is telling this um, this, that's what's going on in my mind when I'm seeing David tell this, this Goliath, this Goliath, what's about to happen. It's like, this is how it's about to go down, right? So that you can know. So when it happens, you'll know my God is a living God. And he's speaking right because you've been speaking some stuff. You've been talking this smickety smack. You uncircumcised Philistine for 40 days and 40 nights. You've been talking this smack about what you going to do, and just send somebody out so you can kill them and we can serve you. Now, he's saying today, right? Not tomorrow. You've been smickety-smacking for 40 days and 40 nights, but I'm going to tell you what's about to happen today, right? Now, this is David. This is a man who has been anointed in a youth, right? Anointed by the living God, amen? So he knows who he is. He knows who he's representing. Some of these guys in his army have not had relationship with the living God. They know that Saul, Shaul, their king has been anointed by God. They know that he's been chosen by God to lead them. But as far as a relationship with the living God, I think some of them forgot. I think they must have forgot because they're shaking in their boots about a nine foot, nine inch man. Right now, if they would have known that the living God, and not only is He much bigger than that, but He's able to do with a, a youthful boy. Right, David knows this. They weren't there when David grabbed the bear and the lion and slapped him, or you say smacked it. I smacked it, and then I killed it. Amen. I took back what He took from me and my dad, and then I killed it after I smacked it. Right. So, so they weren't there when this happened, but David was there. There are some things that you have experienced that you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God is alive in you, with you, for you. Amen? And nobody can talk you out of that. And so that's why you are needed for that position. Whatever that opportunity and that position is. You've been doubting yourself. You've been saying, why me? Why can't God just choose another? There's a reason why God can't just choose another. Because you have been in some situations that have authenticated you for this position, for this time, for this season. Amen. So rise up, man up, and take your position. Amen. It's not for the uncircumcised. It's for the armies of the living God. It's for the child of the living God. It's for that warrior of the living God. Amen. That's you. Amen. The Lord is ministering to somebody in their left side be healed in the presence of Yeshua. Amen. So let's look at that again. 46. So today, Yahweh will hand you over to me. I will attack you. <laughs> lop off your head. Or shall I say, lop your head off. And give the carcasses of, of the army of the Philistim to the birds in the air and the animals in the land. Then all the land will know what? That there is a God in Israel. See this right here. When he's out there 40 days threatening the armies of the living God, what he's saying is there is no God in Israel. That's what Goliath is saying. And that's what your giant is trying to say. There's no God in you, Elizabeth. There's no God in you, Samuel. There's no God in you, Derek, Turk. There's no God in you. That's what they're trying to tell you. Lily and Delilah. They're trying to speak these things that Goliath is trying to say that there is no God in you. Sarah. Amen. And some of the names that I'm hearing can't really pronounce them quite right because they're coming at me kind of fast. But put your name in there. 
if the Goliath is threatening you, as he's coming out and taunting you 40 days, 40 nights, whether it's in regards to your rent, in regards to you losing your job, he's threatening you and he, what he's saying is there is no God in you. There's no God alive in you. And so you have either one of two choices. Either you go shake in your boots and go hide, or you stand up against this thing and you say today, whoo, glory to God, today, God, has anointed you. And I'm not saying God is going to send an angel with a flaming sword. I'm saying today God's anointing you to cut off the head. Hold on, let's look at it. What's he going to do today? He says he's going to hand you over to me. All right, so that right there lets you know that you're not going to have to wrestle this thing down, but it's going to be handed over to you. It's going to be handed over to you in the palm of God. That's like when you see these, um, if you ever watch a, a mobster or mafia kind of movie where they, where they bring the person in, they got them all hemmed up in a headlock or hands behind the back or, you know, three, four people holding somebody and they hand them over to you. Now, what you going to do to them? You know, they got them tied up on a chair or something, an interrogation, they hand over. This is how God is handing over Goliath to you. Amen. In a position where he cannot do anything to defend himself against the army of the living God. Wow, this is amazing. He says, okay, so God's going to hand you over to me. All right, that's what's going to happen. Today, today, whatever today is that you're writing, is today. When you're watching this, you're viewing this today. This is what God is doing. Amen. The God of the armies of Israel. Those of you who are covenant, if you're not in covenant with God, get in covenant with God. So that today, he can help you deal with this Goliath. And then he says, I will attack you. <laughs> God's going to hand you over. I'm going to attack you. Right? Now God's going to hand you over and I'm going to say, oh, please, God, what you going to do now? God, kill him. God, hit him. God, cut him. No, no. He says, I'm going to hand him. God's going to hand you over to me and I'm going to attack you. And now, and then I'm going to lop your head off. Now, you're not even talking about hitting you in the gut. Not talking about cutting off your fingers and all this. No, I'm going to cut your head off. Why? Because when you cut the head off, you cut off the authority. So now Goliath has no more authority. He has no more mouth to speak these words of devastation into your life so that you're not hearing these words of devastation. It's just a silence. It's just a peace. Now, you might be able to see the remains. You may be able to see that head, but it's off. It's no longer connected. It's no longer a threat. Amen. Then he says, I'm going to give the carcasses of the army. So Goliath's not by himself, right? There's an army with them, but nevertheless, we're going to deal with them because their carcasses are going to be given to the animals. Oh, I'm sorry, to the birds in the air. Amen? That's the angels. And to the animals in the land. That's more angels or heavenly help. Amen? The heavenly help. You deal with the head and then your heavenly help is going to be there with you. It says, then all the land will know. Everybody around you is going to know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that Yahweh does not save by sword or spear. For this is Yahweh's battle. Hallelujah. It's not by your sword and by your spears. It's Yahweh's battle. And he will hand you over to us. Yahweh, the living God, will hand Goliath, Goliath, over to us. When the Philistine got up, approached, and came close to meet David, David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. We're talking about Goliath now. We're talking about this champion, champion from his youth. We're talking about a man that has had them shaking and trembling for 40 days and 40 nights, and David's running at him. He's not walking, he's not trying to sneak up on him, he's not tippy toeing, he's running at him. Mm. That is called trust in the living God. It says David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. So this Philistine has an army behind him, there's an army with him, and David's running toward all of that. He knows that Israel, the, the armies of the living God are not, are not running behind him. 
He's running. He's out there all by himself, but it doesn't matter to him because he knows that the living God is with him. Whether he be the whole army of the living God by himself or not, he knows that he's good and he's got it covered. Amen. So, 49. So, David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone all while he's running, and hurled it with a sling all while he's running. It struck the Philistine in his forehead, buried itself in his forehead, so that he fell face down on the ground. Thus, David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking the Philistine, killing him. But David had no sword in his hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword. Mm, mm, mm. The same sword, talking about the, the word, right? The sword of the spear, which is the word of God, where the sword of Goliath is Goliath's word, Goliath's word. So he took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and finished killing him, cutting off his head with his own words. Mm, mm, mm. And when the flesh them saw that their hero was dead, they fled. That's how it is. As you ever, God forbid, you ever have to come into, uh, into um, you know, come to fist with a, a gang or a group of people, but you hit the one with the loudest mouth, call themselves the leader, you deal with him, the rest of them will run. All right. Don't ask me how I know, but I know. Okay. Uh, when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. Verse 52. The men of Israel and Yehuda got up, shouting, and pursued the flesh all the way to God. Now they, now they understand. Now they get it. Now they got the revelation that, oh yeah, we're the armies of the living God. And so now they're chasing and pursuing them all the way to God. And the gates of Ekron, the wounded flesh fell down all along the road from Shah Arayim to Gat and Ekron. After chasing the Philistim, the army of Israel returned, plundered their camp. David took the head of the Philistine, brought it to Jerusalem, but he put the armor of the Philistine in his tent. When Shaul saw David, it's like he took it as a, as a trophy. When Shaul saw David go out to fight the Philistine, he said to Abner, the army's commander, Abner, whose son is this boy? By your life, O king, Abner replied, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this boy is. As David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him, brought him to Shaul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Shaul asked him, young man, whose son are you? And David answered, I am son of your servant, Yeshai, the Bethlachmi, or the Bethlehemite. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. This is like a classic story. Amen. We're talking about the living God, serving the living God. I trust that God has imparted not only something into your mind, but into your heart, into your soul. Amen. And that his angels will be with you to help you deal with your Goliath today in the name of the living God. The God of Heaven's armies, Yahweh Shaul. Until next time, beloved, Shalom.